I first learned to be jealous of soccer when I got into baseball in 1999, when the way they operate in terms of brand affinity was something that I wanted for my team, whether it was the Expos or the Marlins. I wanted people to love our baseball team the way people in the English Premier League, the way those fans loved their team, the way they interacted with their team. It took 10 years in the sport before I made the trek. Some would say it's a pilgrimage. In 2009, I went to what is called the, I completely forgot what it's called, the Northwest Derby. Is that possible what it's called? The Northwest Derby? I think it's Derby or Derby, I can't remember. But in any case, that is when Manchester United plays Liverpool. They call it the Northwest Derby. There's a stadium in Liverpool called Anfield. What I used to do, because back in 2009, we were just beginning to finalize the deal to build Marlins Park. I'd spent years touring facilities all over the country, learning from mistakes, walking around, taking best practices. Then I went to Anfield. I've never experienced a game like I experienced at Anfield. Back then in 2009, Tom Hicks owned Liverpool and Tom Hicks owned the Texas Rangers. You may not know that name. Tom Hicks went bankrupt, basically. Had to sell the Rangers, had to sell Liverpool. He sold it to another MLB owner named John Henry. Yes, you've heard about John Henry. The same John Henry who owns the Red Sox, who used to own the Marlins. So I get to Anfield. I was staying in Manchester, which by the way, Manchester, England, if you want to go to a city that's not London, that's not Paris, that's not New York, it's not Miami, it's not LA. You go to Manchester, you can be up all night partying, dancing. It is one of the top 10 most fun cities I have ever been to, ever. So you wake up, hopefully not in a pool of your own vomit. You get in a car, you drive to Liverpool. We got to Liverpool in time to do some sightseeing. Liverpool is the place where the Cavern Club is. That's where the Beatles first started. You look around, there's museums. You walk around, it's a game day for Liverpool. And man, you. I figured it's a game day. What, what am I gonna see? And then I saw. It was insanity. The pregame festivities start in the morning. There are tens of thousands of people outside of Anfield. There are parades. There are demonstrations. They wanted Tom Hicks at that time. They couldn't stand Tom Hicks. They hated the owner. I was very much able to identify with that. They hated the team president. They hated anyone associated with management calling for them to be eliminated, sell the team, because they hadn't won. And Liverpool is a, a big six. You got to win more than once every 30 years. So there's chanting, there's singing, there's drinking, there's tailgating. There is a level of ruach, which means a level of spirit that I had never seen at any sporting event I'd ever been to before. And I hadn't even walked into the building yet. This was a pre-game atmosphere and not like Lambeau Field, not like Yankee Stadium or Shea Stadium or Wrigley Field, not like Wrigleyville, not like the area around Fenway Park. It's not comparable in any way. I was taking mental notes the entire time. How do I move this experience to, my, to Miami? How do I do that? Then I enter Anfield. Anfield is an old ballpark. It's a stadium. The concession stands, old. The ingress and egress, horrible. We actually said, I was with three friends. We travel to sporting events around the world each year. Not sure what we're going to do in 2020. It's called the Cultural Exchange Club. We are exchanging culture around the world. We've been to the World Sumo Wrestling Championships in Fukuoka, to the Grand Prix in Macau, the Asian Beach Games in Phuket, 
We went to an NFL game in London, an NHL game in Montreal, World Polo Championships in Buenos Aires. We've, we've gotten around. So we wanted to see what it would be like to go to an EPL game. And I said, I got to do this for work anyway, quote unquote, let's go. You walk into Anfield, the tunnel that you walk through to access your seat only goes three wide. It's so thin that it looks like you're at the Colosseum in Rome. And then you walk out and you see the field and the sea of people. And it is awe-inspiring. And the game wasn't starting for about 45 minutes. All of a sudden, we sit in our seats and a song breaks out. You'll never walk alone. A chant. The emotion of the fan base was so heightened that I had the epiphany before the puck dropped that there was no way to bring this experience to the United States. And then I started thinking about why that is. And I realized that in Liverpool and in other places around England, it is not just adults who are obsessed with soccer and the EPL, it's kids. And the obsession these kids have is based both on supply and demand. There's no other major sports, some NFL games, but a pittance. Baseball hadn't been there yet. NBA, their star players they love, but not the game. They love the player. The academies that these teams run for kids gives them a love of soccer and a desire to play, and it is such good business. They invest tens of millions of dollars in youth soccer to build them up as fans and in the rare occurrence like a shooting star to develop a player. If the players aren't good enough in the academy, they move on in their lives to other professions, but what they don't lose is their brand affinity to their team. It is so deep that it makes the Yankees Red Sox look like they are Marlins Rays in terms of a rivalry, in terms of a rabid fan base. There's a section during the game for Manchester United fans. It's like guarded. It's the visitor's section. You don't root for Man U if you're in the Liverpool part of the stadium, and you don't root for Liverpool if you're in the Man U part. And this isn't about rioting. This isn't about violence, though it's happened from time to time when people drink too much. Do you know that during the game, there's chanting back and forth? There is amazing crowd involvement. You know what there's not? Hawkers up and down the aisle selling beer. Do you know what there's not? Excuse me, coming through. Sorry, excuse me, coming through. Sorry, excuse me one second, coming. Sorry, thanks, sorry, excuse me. That's what you do when you get up in the middle of an inning and want to go get a beer and a hot dog from the concession stand. Guess how many fans get out of their seats during the course of a Liverpool Man U game at Anfield? The over-unders won. Which way are you going to go? Go under because they would rather pee in their pants than miss one second of the match. I'm not kidding. They're not getting online to get an extra beer. They're bringing four in before halftime. Then they're going out during the half, waiting online, making a bet, bringing four more in for the second half. 45 minutes per half plus extra time. That's the investment of the game. It's a 95 minute game plus the halftime, which is, I don't know what, 10 minutes, 15 minutes at most. You know what you're getting. You party all day. You bring your family. You go with your friends. You go with clients. You go, you go, you go, no matter what. And if you can't get in the stadium, you're outside the stadium. Just doesn't happen that way in the U.S. It will never happen that way in the U.S. Not for lack of trying, but for lack of investment. I could cure it, I think. Major League Baseball is doing an interesting job. They're trying to invest in youth baseball. Major League Soccer is trying to imitate EPL. 
Syria, ah, La Liga. They're trying to figure out how to get people to love soccer here in the US. They're beginning to have academies starting that process. But in the US, as Coca so perfectly put out during our pre-show meeting, there's so many choices that American kids have. So many different sports. How can you expect them to have that sort of love and affinity to one? It won't work that way. Well, it could, but the level of investment and the number of years and decades it would take is something that no current owner wants to do. It is very hard to get an owner of a sport to plant a tree whose shade he will not enjoy. They all claim, and I did too when I was running a team, that my job is to do things that I won't get to enjoy forever, that I always told you that I was holding the, uh, the, the ball, but I didn't use that, in, in, in track and field, Coca, the baton, that I was holding the baton for the next president. I really believe that. But at the same time, if I'm asked to make a multi-million dollar investment in an academy, I'm going to do it as maybe part of being responsible from a community standpoint. But if I'm short of money and I'm losing money, that's the place where I'm going to look to cut or I'm going to want the academy to run on its own. That's not the way to do it. You've got to have the long-term view like they do in the EPL and in those cities, but it takes time and it takes a level of effort that I'm not convinced that anyone here in the States will ever do.